This is the story of the Space Shuttle Atlantis on the STS-27 mission. Now, I know this video is a bit different than what we usually do on this channel, but ever since I was young, the Space Shuttle has captivated me in a way that no other spacecraft has. Ten-year-old me was quite saddened to find out about the retirement of the Space Shuttle. I remember seeing vehicles that were supposed to replace the Space Shuttle, like the Ares launch system, and I just could not fathom why we were going back to a capsule from something so cool and majestic as the Space Shuttle. Even though the Space Shuttle was a product of the 1980s, it just looked so futuristic. So yeah, I have a soft spot for the Space Shuttle. That's why I'm doing this video, to look back at a little known sliver of Space Shuttle history. On the 2nd of December 1988, the Space Shuttle Atlantis was on the pad at Launch Complex 39B, ready to launch into space. But the mission was no ordinary mission. Hidden in the payload bay of the Space Shuttle was a top secret military satellite. Well, it was top secret at the time. Now we know what the payload was. It was a lacrosse surveillance satellite. It was a part of a series of terrestrial radar imaging satellites. But at the time, the existence of the satellite was not known to many, and it was top secret. Secrecy was woven into this launch. The launch time was only made known 24 hours before launch. All the software they used was highly classified. I imagine that tensions were high for this launch. This was only the second flight after the loss of Space Shuttle Challenger, and NASA was taking no chances. They did not go ahead with the launch on the previous day as the weather was too unruly. But on the 2nd of December, everything looked good. Atlantis went through her go-no-go -no -go poles, and all the transoceanic landing sites were put on alert. Airports from England to Morocco to Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean were ready to receive the space shuttle, just in case she needed to make an emergency landing should something go wrong. At 9.30 a.m. EST, the main engines were lit, and Atlantis started its journey to space. The launch went off without a hitch, and the astronauts got to work. They used the space shuttle's robotic arm to deploy the top-secret satellite. But something went wrong, and the crew had to do a secret spacewalk to fix the issue. But the satellite was away, and that was the end of that. On the 3rd of December, 1988, the crew awoke to some troubling news. Their launch had not been as perfect as they had thought. Review of the launch footage had shown that a bit of the insulator on the right-hand solid rocket booster had broken away and the footage also showed the debris impacting the fragile thermal protection system of Atlantis. If the heat shield was significantly damaged, there was no way that Atlantis would survive the fiery re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. The crew decided to use the mechanical arm to visually inspect the thermal protection system, or the TPS. They looked at the forward part of the payload bay near the nose on the starboard side. All looked well. The panels were in place. But when they got to the belly of the orbiter, they looked on in horror. Let me quote from an astronaut on board. We could see that at least one tile had been completely blasted from the fuselage. End quote. Hundreds of tiles had white scars on them, indicating damage. The loss of one tile was probably survivable, but they had no idea as to the full extent of the damage. Their arm could not be maneuvered to look at the leading edge of the wing, the area that experienced the most heating on re-entry. Mission specialist Richard Mullane radioed NASA and said, Houston, we're seeing a lot of damage. It looks like one tile is completely missing. End quote. Commander Robert Gibson chimed in. Mike's right, we're seeing a lot of damage. NASA reassured the crew, telling them that the breach was not significant, but NASA did not have a complete picture of what was happening. Literally. Due to the secretive nature of the mission, Atlantis was not allowed to beam back high-resolution images of the thermal protection system. They had to use an encrypted channel, which severely limited quality. So much so that NASA engineers thought that the images represented light and shadows. Nothing to worry about. Gibson was furious. He knew what he was seeing and he was convinced that the orbiter would not survive re-entry. But there was nothing that he could do. He asked his crew to enjoy the rest of the mission because there was no point in going out all tensed up. On the 6th of December, as Atlantis was over the Indian Ocean, she began her deorbit burn. They were aiming for the runway at Edwards Air Force Base. As Atlantis began to hit the atmosphere at hypersonic speeds, everyone monitored the data coming in. They did not have access to the temperatures of the TPS. Only NASA could see those. Richard Mullane kept imagining molten aluminum being smeared backwards like rain on a windshield. 
Commander Gibson had his eye on the Elevon trim gauge. The Elevon is a control surface that is a combination of an elevator and an aileron. It's on the trailing edge of the wing. If the damage was starting to tear the orbiter apart, they'd have more drag on one side and the flight computer would try to correct the asymmetric drag by trimming the elevons. On a normal landing, you'd barely see the elevons being trimmed. So, Gibson decided that if he saw more than 0.25 degrees of trim, then he'd tell NASA exactly what he thought of their analysis. At that point, when he saw 0.25 degrees of trim, he'd have about 60 seconds left, and that's how he wanted to use his last 60 seconds. To everyone's relief, Atlantis made it through the atmosphere. Her double sonic boom echoed through the desert. As soon as the wheels stopped rolling, engineers took a look at the orbiter and shook their heads in disbelief. The damage was far worse than any of them had expected. Atlantis had made it back, but by the slimmest of margins. Since the damage had been so severe and so far beyond what everyone had expected, they treated the incident as something that needed a full investigation. First off, they collected data from 19 other launches to see if this was a one-off occurrence. Multiple launches had suffered strikes from falling debris. But no other mission had it as bad as STS-27. The right side of Atlantis took more hits than any other mission. Something had to be different compared to previous launches. They had never seen damage like this on this scale before. They gathered all the data that they could and reconstructed the trajectory of the shuttle, modeling temperatures and aerodynamic loads on the vehicle as it ascended through the atmosphere. They wanted to see if anything was out of its design limits. But no, everything came back clean. They zeroed in on the nose cap of the solid rocket booster. Analysis of the white streaks on the tiles showed that it was made of paint used on the SRB nose caps. They now looked at how the SRB nose cones were manufactured. After being manufactured, the nose caps were painted with a special type of paint called Hypalon. This paint is designed to keep humidity out. Usually, the nose cap is painted 15 days after manufacture. But in this case, the nose caps for STS-27 were left exposed to the humid air for about 45 days. Their study showed that the material of the nose cap, MSA-1, showed a 30 to 40 percent reduction in strength after being exposed to humidity for seven days. This meant that the nose cap material could not handle the high loads that it was subjected to. It could only take 36 psi of pressure instead of the 100 psi that it was designed for. In addition to that, they found out that the heating experienced by the forward assembly of the nose cap was only 40 percent of what it was designed for. So they could reduce the amount of insulation on the nose cap, which could reduce instances of debris impact. The orbiter was surging past Mach 2.5 when it was hit by the insulation debris. At these speeds, there's a shock wave around the orbiter, and a small piece of debris just cannot make it past the shock wave. In this case, the debris that hit the orbiter was estimated to be 0.25 inches thick, 10 inches long, and 5 inches wide. In the end, the manufacturing process of the nose caps were changed. Before we wrap up for the day, I just want to take a quick look at the findings and recommendations for this incident. Recommendation 1 is all about reassessing all potential debris sources to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again. They had to look over all the designs and do additional testing if there were any flaws. Finding 8 hits too close to home. Quote, it is apparent that all shuttle elements have made great progress in eliminating debris sources, as evidenced by comparing early and recent ascent photography. There remains other areas for product improvements that could further reduce debris potential, particularly the external tank. It is recommended that the program actively solicit design improvements directed towards eliminating debris sources or minimizing damage potential. End quote. This was in 1989. 14 years before Columbia took to the skies for the last time. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. A big thank you to NASA and the Space Archive for letting me use their amazing footage on my video. I'll catch you guys next time. Stay safe.